broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Yes, and good morning, and welcome to the Elso Advisor webinar uh, explaining the 100 bushel yield gap. Excuse me, the 100 bushel yield gap. It's brought to you by the Illinois Soybean uh, Association and the Soybean Checkoff. Uh, my name is Dan Davidson, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping details, uh, logistic things to, discover, to discuss. Um, if you in, when you registered, if you included your CCA number, that will be at the end of the webinar. It, that will your CCA number and your name will be submitted to the American Society of Agronomy to get one credit. In, in one CEU in crop management. If you listen to the recording of the webinar, uh, you can go online into your account and you can self-apply for one CEU for this webinar. Uh, as we go through today uh, and during the webinar, as you begin to think about uh, questions, you'll notice over on the dashboard to the side of your screen, you can post questions. So please post any questions that you may have in, in response to uh, the webinar and, and Todd's presentation, and then we'll take those questions and Todd will answer as many questions as possible at the end of the webinar. Um, I just want to take this time to actually thank you for coming and participating in the webinar today. We have a series of six or seven webinars planned for this winter, and so just stay tuned to the also advisor to uh, keep up to date on which, what those webinars are going to be. I'd like to then introduce to you our uh, speaker for today, Todd Steinacre. Uh, he is a regional agronomist for AgriGold Seed here in Illinois, in West Central Illinois. Prior to working with AgriGold, he was with Growmark S System, FS System for nearly 10 years as a crop specialist, seed specialist, and a sales agronomist. Todd has an associate degree from Lincoln and Land Community College, a BS in agronomy and business from Western Illinois University and a master's from the University of Illinois. He is a certified crop advisor since 2008. And the past two years, he has also been a soy envoy, uh, contributing blogs, and today he's doing this presentation. So again, on behalf of the Illinois Soybean Association, check off. Thank you for participating in today's webinar. And we'll turn it over to you, Todd. All right, good morning. Can you hear me okay, Dan? Yes, just fine. Okay. Well, uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak today by this morning on growing uh, higher yielding soybeans and understanding the, the challenges that go into it. Uh, but for the most part, you know, uh, building this 100 bushel yield gap is really about developing a, a systems approach. There's not one silver bullet that can obtain this, this higher yielding gap but it's all about establishing a high yield potential. And if the environment is there, uh, I can preserve the top end yield. Uh, so we call this the 100 bushel yield gap because we do know some high yield contest winners can uh, obtain you know, the 170 uh, plus bushel soybeans. And maybe a lot of producers in, in Illinois are kind of right around that 70 to, to 80, 90 bushel gap. So there's still a, a fairly large gap that we can obtain uh, moving forward. But in the bigger picture, the importance of uh, Illinois soybean production, uh, to me, moving forward, this kind of speaks highly of why we need to improve uh, yields, uh, regardless of, of acre size and commodity prices. But there's going to be a huge demand uh, for soybean products moving forward, whether it be uh, food ingredients, industrial products, pharmaceuticals, animal feeds, and then really, uh, you know, hu human nutrition uh, pieces. But, you know, Illinois soybeans, uh, we do produce a very large amount of soybeans that, that uh, you know, count to number two from national export standpoint. But what really helps us out is we've got a really strong logistics system, uh, whether it be from the rail, river, and roads. And a lot of other parts of, of the country and the world can produce good soybeans, but they can't get it to the market. So uh, we've kind of got the best of both worlds. Now it's up to us to really understand how to improve that yield. So as we start looking at uh, improving these yields or kind of bridging this 100 bushel gap. That gap of 100 bushel gain is only important if we can be profitable at it. Uh, you know, once we're profitable and some of these decisions are more sustainable, uh, that's what we want to have year in, year out. But like anything else, it's important to build a budget 
uh, and build a business plan on how we're going to get that gain. Uh, no different than if you're putting a, a net worth statement together for a banker, uh, how you put your uh, farming budget together. Really got to build a budget how we're going to obtain this higher yielding piece. And then really we got to understand why we're doing the, the practices that we're doing because, you know, if we uh, add a new application or a new product to the soybean, we might get biological yield, which might increase, uh, you know, the root size. Uh, we get a greener plant, but we see no, no yield response. Then something else might give us economical yield where we actually seen a, a bushel gain, but for the cost of it, we see no profitable yield. And ultimately, we, we want to see profitable yield. So just because something gives you biological yield this year doesn't mean it can't give you profitable yield the following years and vice versa. So something doesn't work in year one, year two, there might be some other factors in there. So it's really important to understand why we're specifically doing what we're doing and basically validate those decisions. So kind of on the right is looking at uh, different yield uh, budgets, if you will, depending on commodity prices. But, you know, as you go through it, you know, we're going to have additional costs that that stimulate into it, whether it be enhanced uh, fertility, enhanced, uh, you know, seed uh, treatment costs, maybe it's two applications of fungicides, which some of those is what these, uh, these yield contest winners are evaluating. So we really got to build that budget and that business plan of how we're going to obtain it, uh, not just doing the things that we've always done and hope that the environment will favor it. So if we look at uh, Illinois soybean yields, you know, since the early 70s, we've seen a pretty steady uh, increase in yield, uh, as well as nationally, you know, a little shy of a, a half bushel a year from, you know, a genetic breeding gain. But if we look at some of the, these uh, very specific years, you know, um, 1994, we've seen about a, a five bushel gain above the, the trend line average, but also uh, 14, 15, 16, and 17 all had above trend line yield gains. And I'm excited to maybe see what, uh, you know, 18 has in store for. So to me, we've seen a lot of trend line uh, gains here. Not only is that going to be from, you know, genetic gain by breeding, but also I think management practices have changed during this time as well. So environment will dictate what the yield response is. And ultimately yield uh, is the variable about how that crop uh, experienced that year. Um, so if we have years that uh, have good corn growing environments tend to probably have pretty good soybean yield growing environments. Uh, if you look up in the upper right, uh, 1994, 2016, 17, and, and this past year uh, had phenomenal uh, corn and soybean yield. Uh, if we look at the lower left, tend to be where we've seen lower uh, corn yields as well as lower uh, soybean yields in, in the late 80s and in 2012. So, you know, to me, it, it, it's the environment that is going to dictate what the potential yield is going to be, but it's up to us to, to establish uh, a big, broader base so when that environment is uh, able to capture it, we can take, take advantage of it. So when I break down the decisions that, that's made um, on, a, on a particular field or, or a genetic package or building that budget, you know, every decision has to be correlated back to how is this going to impact plants per acre, pods per plant, seed per pod, and then ultimately the weight per, uh, per seed. And down in the yellow, uh, you know, we have genetics, fertility, seed treatment. You know, as we make that decision or we enhance that decision, we got to understand how it's directly going to be impacting one of these other variables. So if you look at genetics, uh, you know, all the way across the top, you know, I, I gave it a Y plus because genetic is directly correlated to how, how that bean is going to interact across all those situations. Seed treatment, you know, I gave it a plus one from an early standpoint to get the, uh, the bean established and emerge early vigor. Uh, everything past that is more uh, maybe indirect value to it, uh, unless we're starting to look at maybe some of the, the SDS type uh, control later in the season. Um, you know, plant health, insects, they're going to have a direct impact later in, in the crop. Uh, planting date can have a huge impact on the, the number of pods and nodes that are, are established by the plant. And then ultimately, it's it all about the amount of sunlight that that plant can capture. So it's a lot on that backside. So as we make decisions, uh, what needs to be in that plant or that budget, we have to ask ourselves, which one of these does it impact? And if it doesn't impact it, it may or may not have value to the crop. So as we start thinking about building that foundation, uh, it's very similar to building uh, high yielding um, 
potential, but a, a building, think of all these different pieces as building blocks. We have to have a strong foundation throughout it to support high yield potential when the environment is there. And if we, um, you know, have a balanced equation across all these factors and really uh, take care of what's out there, we, we, we've established a strong foundation. Now, the mortar between all these bricks is where good agronomy comes in. Uh, and the good agronomy can help, you know, smooth the edges around to help hold things together during uh, regional environmental impacts. Uh, and that's really where it kind of helps to have good, good sound, good agronomy to make some of these decisions uh, for the environment. Now, if for some reason we, we ignore the basic foundations uh, from soil fertility, seed placement, but we spent so much time figuring out what seed genetic we want to have that we, we basically spent too much time focused on one area and not enough on some other areas. So basically our foundation for top end yield is going to have some issues. And there's no amount of good agronomy that can offset all these issues. Likewise, if we uh, gave very little uh, attention to some of these, these basic foundational pieces and we waited till uh, R3 or R4 and decide to make a fungicide insecticide application, there's no way by, by having a weak foundation then all of a sudden doing a last minute recovery uh, with a fungicide is not gonna op uh, optimize our yield. So uh, yield has been compromised since, uh, since the get-go. So as we're building yield, um, you know, most fields, if we're in the, the 70 to 90, uh, you know, bushels per acre, that means half the field is well above it, half the field is well below it. And to increase our, our overall yield, um, we're not going to take the good areas and make them great. Yes, with the management that we do, we are going to have some increases there, but what we'll really focus on is taking these areas that are below the average and building those up. And really it's up to us to understand, um, you know, throughout the season or maybe after the season's over, to go and understand why those areas yielded as low as they did. And those are the microenvironments that we need to focus on. Was it an establishment issue? Was there just not enough beans there or plants? Uh, was it a root zone issue from compaction, uh, saturated soils, lack of nutrient uptake? And then ultimately was the, the leaf area not strong enough to be able to pull in a lot of the nutrients throughout the season and offset a lot of risk. So we can learn a lot by walking these bean fields and understanding what actually worked and what caused an issue. Now, as we start looking at a given soybean field or given soybean genetics, we must do a SWOT analysis. We need to understand what are the strengths and opportunities of a given bean genetic line. But then also with that, we, we need to understand what are the weaknesses and threats. So if we find a really good, strong bean line, that has high high yielding potential, maybe it's weaknesses that it doesn't like wet feet or it requires uh, medium to better organic matter or maybe has a frog eye leaf spot uh, reduced rating. So we've really got to understand the soybeans and, and manage it the way it needs to be managed to offset a lot of the risk. So when we start thinking about the function of yield, there, there's these two factors that are basically battling out. It's the, the internal factors that come with the good genetics whether it be its, uh, its ability to go on wet feet, it's the canopy structure, uh, it, it, it's the disease package. But then you have this external factor that, that's basically beaten on it. And being a bully, uh, you know, it's all about the weed competition that's out there. It's the, the drainage, the heat, the, the water capability. So we really got to have this balance in there to manage that, that bean genetic lineup. So it's very, very important when we, when we select our genetics. Um, to understand the yield and the agronomics that go with it. Because a lot of times, if, if you think of yield as this pendulum in the middle, and it can swing both ways. So if I swing, you know, genetic one one way, uh, looking for uh, varieties that have good top end yield, maybe I'm giving up some agronomics that I need to know about. Uh, likewise, if I select genetics that are specifically uh, good agronomics, more defensive type product, I could be giving up some yield. So it's really important to understand uh, the different genetic lines and really where they need to be placed at because genetic one on the left, uh, maybe that's more of an offensive type bean, but we need to manage uh, its agronomics. Uh, likewise, you know, genetic three uh, is gonna be something maybe a little bit more defensive, but if we flip flop those in the wrong field, we could have uh, a yield issue. And then genetics number two is probably that bean that can kind of go either direction, uh, you know, a multi, uh, field hitter that can kind of uh, hit things in the middle where, where it needs to go. So 
it's very important to understand which one of these three that your beans do fall under and then really how to not only uh, give it what it needs but also to uh, to manage the placement so we have so much data uh, that's generated throughout the growing season from uh, um, you know combines we've got yield data uh, from yield maps we've got different plot data but so often you know growers might indicate you know I'm going to make my decision based off uh, this one local plot or uh, a third party plot and a lot of times you know that can be kind of skewed because it's not hitting enough enough area of different soil types basic agronomy so what I really like to do is, is find a base genetic that is going to be tested across you know 500 or 1500 different plots in a given area and that's going to look at multiple different soil types uh, the organic matter the basic uh, agronomics, whether it be the, the uh, pH of a soil, the uh, P and K levels, planting dates could be a, a big factor in there. And then really looking at genetics that have been across multiple years of influence because, um, you know, something that did good in 2017 may or may not be good in 18. And likewise, if something was good in 18, may or may, may not be uh, a stellar product in 19. But we got to understand how those beans interact across the mold. Uh, a wider um, magnitude. And then really the bottom one, you know, I, I tend to look for percent wins. If a given genetic is winning 70 to 80% of the time against uh, maybe its sisters in a lineup or even uh, other genetic families in the market, if it's winning 70 to 80% of the time, I know that that's a stellar product and I really understand where it needs to go and where it doesn't need to go. Now, if I pick something that did really good in one specific plot, uh, maybe it's one that only does good 25% of the time and across year in year out that might not be a good decision so at the end of the day just because uh, it did good in a local plot doesn't mean it's going to do good in your field likewise a great uh, variety can fail with the wrong management practice and placement so this kind of leads into what I call the in-law variable uh, with with the holiday season I'm sure a lot of people's interacting with uh, their in-laws and, and traveling around but if you think about the, the smiley face on the left, it's all about how you like to, to live your lifestyle. On the right might be who you're going to visit and, and your in-laws maybe. You each separately have the things that you like to do so you have a good outcome at the end of the day, end of the week, uh, and so forth. So if you go and visit them, you know, they're basically pushing their lifestyle onto you. They're happy, but it, it's messing with your lifestyle the way you have wants and needs. So then... Uh, your yield is uh, a negative experience. So think of that soybean um, from producer on the right and then the soybean itself on the left. If we grab a really good soybean and we give it the fertilizer program, the plant health or lack of plant health, or even field placement that it doesn't want, and we're going to give it based off what logistically works uh, from our program, you know, that soybean's probably not going to have all of its needs and wants, um, you know, maximized. So in turn, you know, maybe the, the smiley face is for, for the grower coming out of this decision. In turn, maybe the soybean didn't have a good experience, so its yields were low. And then in turn, the grower's not going to be happy because the yield's not there. So it's really important to understand what that soybean wants, and we give it to it versus managing every soybean the way we think all soybeans need to be managed. So that's where it's very important to uh, profile a lot of these products and, and multiple uh, environments, multiple data sets across multiple win ratios, and basically understand what the fertility needs of that bean is. Uh, plant health, maybe certain beans have really high, high yielding potential, but it has a frog eye or an SDS concern. And if we're not managing that for that specific bean, we can have issues. So as, as we understand what these beans need, even for a given field, yeah, it might be uh, little logistic issues, uh, but at the end of the day, that soybean is going to be very happy. Uh, with its experience, in turn, the, the grower is going to be happy with the yield. So there, there's kind of a theme going on here that it's so important to start your, your yield foundation with uh, the right selection of genetics. So uh, I brought in some data from uh, Dr. Bilo's work in 2016 across several locations looking at uh, the power of, of not all beans created equal. And if we look at these 28 varieties, um, you know, there's a, a 31 bushel swing in there there's 17 different yield zones and maybe um, you know what I tend to look for is the thirds how many beans fall into that that upper third of yield or lower third of yield and if it's in a lower third of yield across multiple environments 
that's probably telling me it's not a very good yielding bean across uh, you know all environments. But if it's always in the upper third of yield environments, that probably is a pretty good bean to work with. Um, you know, if we look in Champagne, about a 17 bushel difference, uh, about uh, 12 different. Uh, environments and then if I look at Harrisburg almost a 30 bushel difference uh, from you know variety one to the the latter variety so there's a huge swing in selecting the right variety so if, if I just use easy numbers if there's 60 seed brand options if each brand has roughly 15 varieties there's three seed treatment options there's three planting dates that you can consider there's three populations and maybe there's five different platforms of traits you know, there's 121 different decision sets that could be made and it's so very important that we get that right and if we looked at those three trials from Dr. Bilo, um, majority of the time you know four or five or six varieties were the ones that were in the top yielding uh, of his data set so it's so important that you know with all these potential uh, options that we kind of filter through and get it um, once we've got that bean selected, it's so important that we protect it from even a cyst nematode. Um, you know, this chart kind of describes, you know, if year one, we have a, a bean and then we take it out a bean for year two, we go to corn. Year three, we go back in with soybeans. The thing is, most soybeans have all the same um, uh, cyst trait, but it's expressed differently in every single bean. So, you know, when we get back to year one, if we use genetic one, you know, by year three with that field, we need to actually switch that to a different genetic uh, family just so we don't have some uh, tolerance built up and have some root feeding. So, so very important to not only select the right bean, but make sure we're, we're truly rotating it. Uh, you know, it's so important to understand the fertility um, and then some plant health of these products. Uh, this is actually a data set um, from uh, Brant Consolidated. You know, looking at different micro packages uh, with some nitrogen, some boron, and even a fungicide treatment. So every bean is going to be different how it interacts, but until we're doing data sets and truly understanding uh, th this combination effect or, you know, one plus one equals four impact on some of these beans, uh, it it's so very important to understand uh, this information. Um, and there's a lot of good resources out there that that is third party. So when we look at uh, from an early management standpoint, I think uh, planting date is very critical uh, for establishing a high yielding uh, environment. Coming out of the 2017, um, you know, winter meetings going into the 18 crop, to me, this was the number one message that uh, producers in Illinois got, got the message loud and clear, plant your beans early. Because we know if we start getting into uh, mid uh, mid, May, and later, you know, our percent of maximum yield really starts to taper off. And this is looking at multiple years uh, from North and Central Illinois uh, through Dr. Nastinger's uh, program. And granted, you, you can see some different variabilities from year to year. Early planting is, is always going to be subject to, to change based off where you are geographically, because where I'm at in, you know, Southwest Illinois might be a different early date than somebody uh, in Galesburg or even further southern Illinois. So early is all de dependent on where you're geographically located. But, you know, that was six years worth of data. Here's a, a data set from uh, Monsanto's Learning uh, Center in Monmouth. Uh, they're actually looking at different um, fungicide applications on dates. But if we just look at, you know, this early planting date compared to the late planting date, you know, even 2017, we're still seeing uh, quite a bit of a yield response to planting soybeans early. Um, you know, if we're looking at from the, the solar radiation, soybeans need that energy. Uh, and this is actually pulled off of uh, the state website, looking at the different uh, day variations on the, the solar radiation that's coming down to the soil and or to the plant for energy. And if I look at the, the one that's kind of in yellow is 2018. Uh, this is gonna be uh, April 25th through the, the first part of May. You know, we see a lot of, of long gaps in here, and this is where we're going to start seeing good multiple days of good sunlight obtaining it uh, compared to, you know, 2012, 16, and 17. You don't really start seeing a lot of those big gaps in here multiple days. So we start seeing a lot of ups and downs, and that can really influence uh, how well the, the, the crop is growing and then ultimately the nutrient uptake. So if we look from an early season management, any decision that we do at this time is going to improve the, the emergence and our early vigor. And I would say most growers 
today are utilizing seed treatments from a basic fungicide insecticide to get the crop up and established. But, you know, moving forward, a lot of these high yielding uh, growers are evaluating some of these enhanced seed treatments, whether it be something going after SDS from an early planted, uh, looking at cyst nematodes, and then ultimately looking at uh, inoculants to help to spark, um, you know, the, the nitrogen ability for the plant. Uh, root zone development or tillage, a lot of times we don't really give much consideration to, to tillage or maybe the consideration of the, the environment that root is growing in uh, compared to a corn plant. But just in general, the corn plant has a, a wider footprint. It's got more uh, penetrating root system that can help get through some compaction or, or grabbing nutrients from a larger radius out where soybean, you know, it's got more of a tight, long, narrow tap root. Uh, so its footprint isn't near as big. So maybe there's opportunities to be looking at, at starter fertilizers to help put some nutrients more positionally available to that root system. So if we're looking at from a, a planting date from an earlier standpoint, uh, these pitches are actually from 2011. Uh, the left is looking at an April 14th planting date. Uh, on the right is a, a May 21st planting date. And the pictures was taken uh, on June 9th. So you can tell how much difference there is between the two canopies uh, and then the potential energy that, that's being brought in, the, the nutrient uptake, and just the root system has a better, more aggressive ability to, uh, to handle moving forward. And as we jump forward uh, another month, we see a lot more aggressive canopy. So the, every decision that we do make, it's all about building a bigger, bigger factory that can produce uh, as many blooms and pods and retain them as we can. So middle season management, it's going to more or less be the, the validation of that genetic selection that we made. You know, did we put that offensive variety into an offensive situation? Likewise, did we not put it into a defensive situation? We're going to have a lot of stresses to it. Uh, at that time, we can validate uh, a lot of our decisions that we made. And it really correlates back into to what Bilo was saying is that how important um, you know, the bean selection is to, uh, to maximizing our yields. You know, also at this time, uh, fertility uptake. Uh, early on in the season, maybe it's a little slow to, uh, to take some nutrients up, but, you know, we get into that uh, R3, R4, there's going to be uh, a substantial amount of fertility taken in. And this situation is based off, you know, 60 bushel beans. So if we're shooting for 170 bushel beans, that window and that system it has a, a a lot of activity due in a very short amount of time. But I would challenge is how do we currently fertilize our, our soybeans? Uh, you know, are we, are we giving all the fertilizer to the corn crop and what's left over goes to the beans? In a lot of cases, that is the, the situation. But my next question would be, okay, if I, if I fertilize for 130 bushel of corn and I end up getting 180 bushel of corn, how many of those fields went and got supplementary fertilizer going into the next crop 2019's crop to help uh, offset some of this fertility that had uh, had been taken by the corn crop. And for the most part, uh, you know, we know that certain nutrients aren't as efficient or as available in, in the soil. So and we do have a smaller root system that's grabbing it. So uh, a lot of these high yielding guys are, are looking at, uh, you know, in furrow systems or two by two, uh, looking at potassium acetate over potassium chloride to find something that's a little bit more more available. Maybe they're looking at um, early applied nitrogen before the nodulation takes place or even uh, as you go into R5 when, when uh, nodulation has been capped out. Uh, so there's a lot of areas in here that need to be explored to, uh, to help do it. You know, it's not, um, you know, checking a box. Yes, I gave it fertilizer, but is the fertilizer in the right spot in the right quantity? So if we have a plant that is going through a nutritional deficiency, those plants are more predisposed to have a, a pathogen attack it from a disease or even insect feeding. So, you know, not only is it being uh, reduced, um, you know, the, the root shoot growth uh, because of the, the deficiencies in nutrients, but it's also taken on another stress from a, a pathogen or insect. And we know that, you know, most plants can maybe offset a, a single stress situation, but if we start getting stresses on stresses, on stresses, then we're going to start seeing quite a bit uh, of yield response. And we do know that a soybean is always in a flux of equilibrium. So, you know, from week to week, uh, you know, it's always going to try to balance itself out. And for some reason, it has multiple um, stresses during, uh, you know, bloom and pod set. 
you know, it, it can't abort those to create equilibrium within the plant. So it's so, so vitally important to have some of these nutrients uh, so close to the plant, especially uh, K and, and even boron that's very uh, important from a, a flowering standpoint. So most of the time we don't talk about nitrogen as it relates to soybeans because soybeans can create their own nitrogen. However, as we start shooting for higher yielding soybeans, uh, is the environment appropriate for those nodules to uh, to produce the amount of nitrogen that it needs? Um, you know, if a corn plant needs 1.2 units of nitrogen per bushel output, a bean plant is going to be in that four to five. But how much time do we actually give to make sure that that nitrogen isn't a limiting factor? Um, you know, if we start looking at things that that influence lack of nodulation, it's uh, poor soil health, uh, low pH, um, dry soils or wet soils, anywhere we have lack of oxygen or just soils that have high nitrate. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of thought on supplementing some nitrogen early on until this uh, factory can be built, but also looking at um, seed applied inoculants that can help stimulate some of this early on in the season to help make sure nitrogen isn't the limiting factor. Because we know as, as we strive for higher yield, uh, those nodulations can only produce maybe 50% of the, the total nitrogen needed by that plant. So at some point, we need to uh, refocus our thoughts on nitrogen. Uh, the, the slides in the middle are, are uh, two plants or a trial that I did. Um, so you can see my mouse, the one on the left, uh, did not have an inoculant. We see a smaller root system, system no no, uh, nodules on it. Over here on the right, we see a more uh, lateral roots, wider footprint. We do see some no uh, nodules growing in there. We do see a, 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 a growth stage advantage. Uh, and then definitely utilizing uh, yield mapping capabilities, we can actually see right here this yellow zone is the, the, the untreated. Um, and there's about a 14 bushel response by having it treated, non-treated. Uh, and then there's areas actually in that field that was hitting, you know, 120 plus bushels per acre. So it was a high yielding environment high demand from a nitrogen standpoint. So sometimes we need to reevaluate our thoughts. So as I look at, at a late season management, up to this point, it's always been, uh, you know, an R3, R4 fungicide application, really protecting uh, beginning pod and full pod. And if we kind of look over here, you know, each range could take, you know, five to 15 days in there. And if the plant is happy and likes the environment, just like corn, it's going to utilize a wider window. But if we've got stresses on stresses, it's going to start condensing that down. And during this time frame, you know, so much uh, vulnerability to uh, to pot abortion is being taken place right now. So um, protecting this this plant, this uh, this factory during this time is so critically important. Um, but one big influence that could impact it is planting date. So you know, if I plant earlier, I tend to have more nodes, so I have more. Uh, potential blooms and pods per node. So each node maybe doesn't have to work as aggressively. So I've got more ability out there. Uh, this was a trial that I was involved in a few years ago, looking at uh, fungicide insecticide application at R3, R4. Uh, you know, it, it's always good to go back to these fields and, and truly understand what value you got out of it. So as I look at the, uh, the picture on the right, would have been treated. Uh, I see a lot more green material, less insect feeding. Um, so at the end of the day, where, where did I gain my yield? And, you know, totally over here on the far right are the pods that I retained off of it. So not only do I have more pods that were retained off the, 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 the plant, less were boarded, but I retained more three bean pods than I did on the untreated. So not only did I preserve uh, blooms going to pods, but I retained more three bean pods over two bean pods. And that's really where a lot of the yield was, was, uh, was captured. So this is a, a, a data set trial from Bayer this last year looking at, um, you know, new soybean um, fungicide treatment. As you look at the, the piano graphs, we see anywhere from a, a, you know, negative response all the way up to a 20 bushel response. Average kind of being in that 4.3. Well, so this what tells me is depending on the actual bean that was used, did that genetic respond to, uh, to this management uh, pressure? Uh, was there pressure? Um, the field history, um, and then the yield potential. You know, if I'm in a 50 bushel yield environment, uh, you know, fungicides are only going to protect top end yield. It's not a steroid. It's not going to increase yield. So if I'm in a 50 bushel yield response, maybe my total top end yield's not there. 
and a disease pressure mitigation is not going to reduce it. But if I start getting into a 100 bushel or 170 bushel yield environment, uh, that's a lot more stress in that bean plant. So you're probably going to see a lot more yield response to that. So as we look at late season management, uh, R5, R6, uh, anything we can do to uh, protect that full pod. During this time, a lot of remobilization is going on, um, you know, from the, the roots, the stems, the leaves to really pack as many, uh, you know, beans into those pods and, and the weight. But, you know, really up to this point, um, if, if there is a soil compaction issue, it could start to, to uh, show itself from a nutritional standpoint or moisture standpoint. Uh, nitrogen has basically been capped out. Um, so by having a reduction in nodulation, uh, whether it be from too much nitrogen being in the plant early, uh, soil saturations, um, low pHs can cause some of these nodulations not to, to one, take place or, or have the longevity that the plant needs. So that's why there's a lot of uh, evaluation looking at nitrogen leading into that, that R5 time frame, just because there is so much uh, remobilization nitrogen needed in that time. And it can vary from year to year based off uh, water saturation, how much nitrogen was lost early, but then how much mineralization was actually given back in the backside of the plant as well. Uh, as we look at the, uh, the the range of days, you know, we've got a fairly wide window right here, as you look in the, the lower right, that a lot could go wrong during that time frame, whether it be environmental, it could be a disease situation, uh, a lot of things could impact yield. But as we start looking at the bean plant itself, you know, the height has been maxed out, the total number of nodes, leaf area, you know, maximum pods, unless we get some August rains in there, it can kind of give us that bonus at the top. But if, if a plant was under a lot of stress leading into that point, maybe that bonus uh, from that August rain may or may not have a, a large impact. So the, the next layer that some people are starting to talk about is the late season management, and they're calling it R4.5. Uh, and a lot of this is to protect going into R5, R5.5. And this chart on the, the picture on the upper right is just a uh, you know, standard uh, defoliation uh, picture looking at the percent defoliation. Uh, and then on the left-hand side, it's looking at uh, the percent yield drag uh, that was hit at different, different growth stages. So if we're starting to look at 170 bushel uh, beans per acre, and we might have you know, 20% uh, defoliation or, or different things that are impacting those solar panels. And if we start looking at R4.5 and R5, you know, to me, that's a big window right in there. If we start seeing any type of a, of a disease or something that could potentially impact top end yield. So that kind of leads me into, you know, the fungicide insecticide that we did utilize. I have a lot of growers ask me all the time, well, if I sprayed my, my fungicide at, you know, R3, R4, how long does it last? And what happens if I have a disease that comes in later? And really, that's where it comes back to to knowing the type of product you are spraying. Uh, a lot of times, I, I hear growers uh, say, "Oh, I got this really good generic. It, it was a lot less per acre." But what are you giving up? Are you giving up some quality of a residual out there, not only from the fungicide but also the insecticide? So it's so important to not only make these applications but understand uh, the SWAT, the strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, even of the fungicide and insecticides that we're utilizing. Uh, and again, you know, the seed treatments that we made that decision on uh, prior to planting, that's going to minimize some SDS pressures to impact yield. So it's really the season-long uh, influence in building this, this yield gain. Um, this is a, a sister slide, the one I showed early on, as far as the, the solar radiation that's coming down uh, to us for photosynthesis. And we know that during grain fill, a soybean plant likes light. Uh, if we start having a lot of overcast days, we can really start seeing uh, yields drop off. So as I'm looking through the month of August, and I, I'm going to be utilizing uh, this 2018, kind of this yellow, yeah, we see some ups and downs. But if I start looking at these gaps, we, we got um, fairly good windows uh, of long days where we're maximizing a lot of uh, photosynthesis. If I see a lot of gains here, see some through here. Uh, if you look at these other dates, you know, 2012 and 17, you start seeing more of these up and downs. You don't see a lot. There's a stretch right there, but you start seeing all these dips. So that soybean plant is always in, in, in flux and trying to create equilibrium. So uh, it's really good to utilize some of this, this data 
to forecast what that plant might need. If we know that this grain fill period might be in jeopardy, then we need to make a proactive decision. Uh, likewise, if, uh, if it's going to be long or short, kind of prepare for it. So at the end of the day, you know, plant health has a direct uh, correlation to the number of, of total beans that the plant is going to produce, but it also has direct correlation uh, to the size of the bean from having, uh, you know, good plant health to poor plant health. Uh, likewise, once a lot of this has been established, insect feeding uh, can have a direct uh, impact on uh, seed quality or the number of seeds. You know, these here originally established three bean pods, but yet through some, uh, you know, feeding and some other uh, regional issues, you know, we're starting to reduce a lot of those. So we, we established top end yield, but we weren't able to preserve it. Uh, likewise, with uh, bean leaf beetles, we can definitely see some, some pod damage. So anytime we have a damage to that pod, it's going to have a direct impact to that specific bean. Uh, and again, stress on stress. So as I'm looking at, um, you know, kind of looking how to evaluate a lot of these practices, I, I call it uh, the true CSI, the crop soy investigation. Uh, a lot of times we spend uh, a lot of time looking at a cornfield and understanding where yield was gained or lost, uh, kernels long, kernels uh, round, the weights of it. How often is that actually being done in a soybean field, not only in the good areas to validate what worked, but also in the, the sub-average spots of the field. So um, this chart in the lower right is actually what I use. Uh, you know, I want to track how many uh, total nodes were on that plant. And one thing I've seen this year is when we had uh, earlier planting, I was getting more total nodes that bared pods than when it was uh, planted a little bit later. So here, for an example, I had 22 nodes that bared blooms and pods. And when it was planted later, I, I was struggling in some cases to find 18 of them. So, you know, looking at total blooms on, on the, the plant, total uh, nodes without blooms, so those, blo uh, those nodes were there, but they did not produce anything. And then really look at a percentage standpoint. For so long, you know, the industry says we can lose, you know, 70 to 75 percent of our, our blooms to pods, and that's where we're reducing yield. But in a situation where I'm retaining 68 or 62 percent of all my pods going to, uh, to to full maturity and producing yield, you know, something's working in the right direction. Uh, and then also looking at the total number of pods, and of those pods, how many were, were four bean pods, three, twos, and ones? A lot of our yield is going to come from three bean pods. So if we're counting a lot of two bean pods, uh, we know that there was a lot of stress going on out there. And then also I do like to count the number of pods that are to be determined that are still there, but yet they're too small to know what they're going to do. And some of that can be from the, uh, the August bonus. And then I do like to look how many nodules are, are accounted for on each plant to, to understand uh, the situation that the soil was in. So from a recommendation standpoint, I think it's so uh, vitally uh, important to, to growers in the industry to, to do a lot of small scale testing um, on your own farms and fields so we understand uh, the genetic profile of all these products, uh, how well it handles the offense, the defense, and what the structure's like, and maybe when it does need uh, some plant health support or some uh, nutrient um, stability in there. So, you know, from, from year one, maybe it's looked at from a small scale standpoint, uh, just kind of uh, basic profile and product. You know, by year two, you can take that data set and do, uh, you know, more of a, a, a wider farm deployment uh, in different situations, uh, larger scale, you know, we're able to use a lot of the, the technology, um, you know, the planters and, and the combines uh, to track all this data and to validate a lot of this in large scale. And then by year three, you know, have a broad uh, farm deployment. So when you utilize these soybeans that you've been testing for the last couple of years, you know exactly how offensive and defensive they are on. And then you're going to know the plant health of them and how to how to uh, provide what that bean actually needs versus grabbing a new bean every year and just solely relying on uh, some plot data that that's not has anything to do with your farms or fields and your management style. So at the end of the day, knowing the SWAT of a new genetic will allow for higher and more consistent yields. So really it comes down to developing a strong yield foundation. So when that environment uh, allows us to hit higher yields, we've got the foundation built to support it. Uh, it's really important to spend time to sharpen uh, good agronomy um, to help with the, the regional 
environmental differences uh, because what happens in northern Illinois might be different from southern Illinois, uh, but also from year to year or even from one side of uh, your, your farming operation to the next. So good agronomy can help be the glue that keeps all this together. Uh, understanding yield from a biological standpoint, economical standpoint, is profitable yield. So just because something didn't work this year doesn't mean it's not going to work next year and vice versa. So uh, really understanding how to evaluate product is so very key. And then ultimately understanding the soy needs, understand uh, inside and out what that soybean needs and make sure we give it to it. Because at the end of the day, yield is the variable about or the it equals the experience that soybean had. So if that soybean had a very bad experience, its result is poor yield. But if that soybean had a great experience season long and your management systems were part of that, that soybean is going to have a very good response. So with that, you know, that's kind of um, the wrap up of, of the conversation. would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Bilo, Dr. Napsinger for allowing me to use uh, you know, their yield data, uh, Bayer Crop Science, uh, Monsanto's Learning Lab, and uh, Brent Consolidated. Uh, you know, we, we brought in several uh, areas of, of different data. Um, there's a lot of sources out there for data that we can utilize, and don't just be in one camp. There's a lot of uh, you know sources out there to make decisions. Um, thank you for Agrigold for allowing me to work with soybeans every day, and uh, the Illinois Soybean Association for allowing me to uh, to talk today. Uh, actually, at the bottom of the screen, actually has my my email address, todd.steinocker at agrigold.com. If you do have any, any follow-up questions or uh, just want to sit and uh, chat on, on soybean production, feel free to, to reach out to me. I'd be glad to, uh, to talk with you. Okay. Well, uh, Todd, thank you very much for your great presentation. We got some questions to ask, to ask you about your presentation. And I'll kind of lead off with the last question that came in. So with your CSI approach, how many soybean plants per field do you recommend evaluating, you know, to count nodes, boom, nodes, bo blooms, beans, and, you know, and beans per pod? Yeah, so for the most part, I, I don't have a, a set number that I always go look at, but, you know, it's pretty similar in corn. You know, we tend to, to mark off one one thousandth of an acre and kind of maybe evaluate all of them or we, we randomly grab you know, plant number five, 10, and 15. So I, I try to be very uh, random when I grab it, but I also do go try to find some of the, the more unique plants out there to see what, what the top in the building is. But then maybe not far from it is, is a really small runt type plant. So I try to understand both of them together. Uh, but you know, from a soybean standpoint, you know, population is such a, a wide range of conversations um, as far as how many beans we actually need were in corn it's so directly uh, related to, to population. So I just try to find a, a good subsample of, of the, the given area in the field. But what I will do is go to either an area that, that does not look good or historically has an issue based off a, a soil map or a, um, you know, a yield map, something like that. Try to grab those areas and compare it to an area in a good area. Uh, that kind of gives you a good range of what's out there. But just start counting anything you can on it. And just start keeping a list. And you know, uh, as I said earlier, you know that the the field that were planted earlier were actually having more pods or more nodes and everything else than than the later planted ones. So uh, it, it might not seem very important to you at the time, but document all that stuff, and, and uh, really it starts to to evolve the way we think about it. How if uh, Todd, if for 100 bushel soybeans? In a thirty in a thirty inch rows, and let's say a population of one hundred forty thousand, a planting population one hundred forty thousand. What kind of pod count, average pod count per plant are we looking at? Uh, you know that that again is kind of a, a moving target, just because uh, each individual bean plant will uh, will uh, vary quite a bit. Um, you know, um, some of the trials that I did this last year, you know, I was getting anywhere from 80 to 100 uh, pods per plant. Um, so that's kind of a good starting point, but I would also look at how many uh, nodes have actually, uh, you know, produced those pods. Um, so it, planting date had a, a huge impact on the number of total uh, blooms and pods that was retained. So 
but at the same time, you know, that, that beam plan is always in flux of equilibrium. So maybe if it didn't put on enough pods, if later in the season it says, hey, you know, I've got more sunlight, I've got more, more water, more nutrients, instead of them being two bean pods, I'm going to make them more three bean pods. So there's always this fluctuation in there. So when, when doing a lot of the CSI for soybeans, there is no exact uh, structure formula that will work every single time. Uh, really just got to understand what that potential is in there because, again, if we, we've, um, you know, the soybean at the 30 inch row is 140,000 drops you know, going into R3, R4, put on tons of pods, and so it was a high number, but yet a very low percentage of those actually retained out because of a stress, you know, that could throw our numbers off. So that soybean plant is always going in this up and down, uh, you know, to create um, equilibrium. So it, it might be very specific to that bean, and it might be very specific to that field. Our next question. Do you think supplemental sulfur is needed for addressing the 100 bushel yield gap? And if yes, which method of delivery would be, would be best? Well, so, you know, sulfur being one of the, the essential nutrients that, that all plants need to, to grow vegetatively and reproductively. So, uh, so sulfur is definitely important. Um, you know, we know sulfur is very important in corn and, and it helps with photosynthesis. It, it's part of what helps make uh, the plant green. So, as we're building these bigger canopies and bigger uh, energy engines, you know, sulfur is going to be a huge piece to it. And as we know, in the last 10 years, you know, we're not getting as much sulfur back from the emissions. Um, so definitely uh, sulfur is going to be a, a key piece into it. But, you know, to say which, which form and what timing is, is, uh, is most appropriate, to me, that's where it's the, the uh, you know, small scale trials on your own farm and fields to understand where we need to be at. Uh, but I will say a lot of times I, I visit with growers and they're using sulfur, but it's not enough. You know, say, for example, in corn, if we're using one or two units, yeah, that might not be enough to really show an impact until we get to 25, 30 units. So uh, definitely need to look at that standpoint. But also the form of sulfur, uh, if it's elemental sulfur, you know, that's going to take a long time for it to, to break down and, and get back to the plant. So that might be something that needs to be applied. Uh, well before pre-plant or even in the fall, but if it's going to be more sulfate, sulfur, you know, more readily available, uh, you know, it's probably going to be more of an issue or a, a benefit kind of um, early pre-plant time frame. But as we start looking at those response curves and when so much uh, energy is being taken up, you know, a lot of rapid uptake is, is kind of hitting place at that R3, R4. So probably any time prior to that is when it needs to be in the soil, in the root zone. So when those, those for aggress taking it up, it's positionally available for the crop. Okay, another question here. When you were talking about your Nothen study, was that a replicated trial? W which one? Uh, was your soybean and Nothen study replicated? Uh, yes, it was. So actually, the the photos I showed was just one uh, specific example to it. So it was replicated. Um, multiple sites yes it was do you recommend inoculants each and every year on the seed so you know if, if for some reason we're planting into a field that has you know some of those those limiting factors whether it be uh, low soil health pH is an issue uh, maybe it's a field that that's tight uh, and there's a lot of, of oxygen depleted in the soil uh, and maybe we've been out of soybeans for a while. You know, all those factors play into nodulation not being uh, as early or as strong. So as we're going for higher yielding soybeans, I, I think the more that we can do to that seed is going to allow for, for that relationship and that communication to start earlier. So it, it, if we're shooting for 50 bushel beans, um, you know, there, there's probably enough out there to, to sustain it. But if we're starting to shoot for... 100 bushel beans, 170 bushel beans, uh, definitely don't want nitrogen to be the limiting factor. Um, so de I would definitely encourage it. Okay, another question. What stresses, what stresses can increase the yield? Are there any? Stress that, that can increase. We know that sometimes if you stress a soybean plant early, like with Cobra, that could create more branching. So I think that's what maybe what stresses could increase yield. Right. 
Um, you know, it seems like a bean plant, we, a bean plant can go through a lot of, of challenges and stresses from the get go. And as long as we've got some good environment in, you know, August to set some, uh, some pods really good, it seems like that bean plant can go through a lot of stresses where a corn plant, it doesn't want to have a bad day its whole life. So I would say whatever stress, uh, you know, that we, we give to it, um, can pull, you know, pull overall size down because in a lot of situations, the canopy itself is larger than it needs to be. And I'm not saying like the number of leaves or the size of the leaves, but a lot of the branching, you know, anytime it does that, it's actually taking, it, you know, think of it, your debit card, you know, every time it builds that longer or longer inner node that, that's taking a credit out of your, your account that could be used for something else. So to me, anything that can kind of pull that canopy back down, uh, maybe make the, the inner nodes not as, as long or the branches as long, um, you know, that's just uh, have more energy later down the road. So, you know, I, I've had a lot of growers that utilize the, the Cobra effect uh, to kind of stun them down a little bit. And, you know, you can see some responses to that, but um, never very consistently. Uh, but it seems like uh, any of those stresses that can kind of pull it down uh, tend to favor it. Okay. Another question here. Uh... How many soybean varieties are there really? It is likely that they're, you know, with all the multiple brands, a licensing the same variety. Yeah, so it really just depends on, on the germplasm uh, that's out there. You know, if you just look at the different types of, of trait options, whether it be from a herbicide standpoint, there's, you know, the balanced bean, there's the rounded bean, there's the liberty bean, there's, you know, the, the extend and uh, the the other ones coming out. So all of those have different germplasm uh, tied to it. They're not they're not going to be sisters by no means. And then each individual you know brand might have uh, multiple lines that are either exclusive to themselves or you know um, fairly broad, like we, we see in corn sometimes. So to to have an exact number, how many different bean genetic lines are out there, uh, I'm not really sure. But I would would venture to say there's there's less depth in soybeans than there is corn, just because for so long. Uh, corn has been king and there's been more breeding done in corn, um, you know, over the last, you know, 150 years where, where soybeans are just now starting to, to kind of really gain some, some traction. Uh, and, and we've seen that in that, that first couple of slides where we've seen, you know, the genetic gain in the last five years has really jumped up. So a lot of this breeding that's been going on across uh, all the genetic platforms, we're really starting to see this gain, you know, of of three to four or seven bushels above the trend line average. And I'll associate a lot of that to uh, to the genetic breeding. And up to this point, you know, maybe that, that half a bushel response has been just because we haven't got to that point yet. So uh, definitely a lot of a uh, lot of different camps out there, uh, potential germplasm. Uh, but, but I think we have time for two more questions. And here's one, how do we, how do we fine tune maturity group selection to increase yield? Uh, for maturity selection, you know, the, the biggest thing is truly understanding the actual maturity of that bean, you know, because any brand can say, oh, this is a, a 3.8 maturity bean, when in reality, it could have been from a 3.6 to a 4.0. And a lot of times, they, they base that off of how many days past, I think it's R5 to R6, uh, that, that it goes through. So this is where it comes back to, if you have, um, you know, the germplasm on your own farm and field across multiple uh, um, maturity and really track how, how that, that bean matures kind of on that backside, that'll give you a really good idea if it's actually really a 3.8 or 4.0. Now, depending on the season, I would say most growers tend to want to go an earlier bean so they have somewhere to start. But in reality, uh, if we have a wider bean for that maturity zone, we tend to have that wider window to offset a lot of issues. Uh, and it really just depends on that. So um, I, I try not to flex guys too much on the front side as far as an earlier beam, because we see it in corn too. Uh, it, it favors the fuller season. So knowing what, what zone you're in and just kind of nickel dime it on both sides of it. And this is where the, you know, the trials come in handy because if it's a, if it's a season where maybe we, we get uh, early August rain, but then it tapers off in the backside. Our, our early season beans may be favored. But then, firstly, if we get no 
early August rains, but we get a lot of rain towards the backside, then typically the full season uh, tend to cover the yield in a given plot. So that's where it goes back to really profiling the varieties of your own. And just because it says a 3.8, you know, validate that it is truly a 3.8 in of your maturity. Okay. And we have one last question just pop in, uh, Todd. Do, do leaf burner herbicide programs reduce the yield advantage of early planting days? Say that again, Dan. Do leaf burner herbicide programs reduce the yield advantage of early planting soybeans, early planted soybeans? Do, do leaf burners herbicide impact yeah, the early planted? So, so I'm, Does it reduce the assuming the I'm assuming the question is, by using leaf burner herbicides uh, on early, does that impact the crop? Is that maybe what the question is? Well, the question says that if you're using a, the planting early to try to get a yield bump, it, but is that sort of being negated by using a leaf burner program as opposed? To knock oh, out okay, gotcha. Gotcha, gotcha. You, you know, really where, where we're getting from planting early is we are establishing uh, a lot of the, these microenvironments earlier, whether it be the nodulation, um, we're getting, um, you know, the bean up and going, taking in more photosynthesis, so it can build uh, its establishment. Now, if we use a, a leaf burner and we're not into a, a flowering stage, um, you know, I would say we're going to have a very minimal impact on it. But if we plant early, we're using burners and we're getting into uh, the stage where, where we're you know, really setting uh, some of these blooms out there, you know, we could start seeing some issues. Uh, no different than if we planted at a regular time frame and we start spraying, uh, you know, e even, you know, the Cobras, the, the burners like that uh, during, you know, R3 time frame, uh, any type of that stress can, can nip those those type products. So uh, to say it has a huge impact on it, I, I'm, I'm not I'm not really sure, but I would almost believe that, that it does not, uh, especially if we, we get it when we don't have, um, you know, a lot of uh, blooms that are susceptible. But as long as we've got good, good growing conditions and we can get photosynthesis in and we get that next growth going, uh, that should be pretty minimal stresses on the plant. But if we get in a situation where, you know, heavy overcast, we don't get a lot of sunlight, uh, you know, like that chemistry is sitting there burning on it. We, we don't have the, the, the photosynthesis going on to, to bring up the next growth. Then we could have some issues. But that's probably going to be more of a, a you know, a micro environment to make that decision. It's kind of, we're, you know, flexing that agronomy at that time to make that call. One last, one last quick question, Todd, before we wrap up. Like you to, we'd like you to weigh in on narrow, narrow versus wide row soybeans, 30 versus like 20s or 15s. Where do you think where do you think the growers should go? Yeah, you know, it's a a very wide moving target. Um, you know, from my standpoint, I like a narrow road bean. Um, to me, it kind of allows more space for the bean, uh, and it gives a, a faster opportunity for that that canopy to get closure. Um, so, I, I, you know, as I'm sitting back thinking of wheat press come through, or you know, the more sunlight that can hit the the bean, not the soil. And if there's more um, sunlight hitting the soil, we're getting more evaporation. So we're, we're taking more uh, moisture out of the crop. Now, a lot of the data that I've seen, um, it's very hard sometimes to see, uh, you know, a, a direct yield impact from it. Now, if we start getting on some lighter soils in Western Illinois, you know, I can almost always find a, a yield response in those environments just because we're able to protect that canopy a little bit more. Um, but, you know, uh, across a large, realm um you know most growers are going to use you know one planter to do their corn and bean uh if, if i had my pick if they did a 30 inch on their corn and, and did something narrow on their beans i would actually kind of prefer that uh and then you know all those other sub reasons so if we can eliminate all these other reasons and we do get into a stress where you know moisture is a little bit more of a a, a scarce resource and we've got uh you know more weed pressure out there i, I think all those other sideline benefits really start to to really shine themselves, but at the end of the day, it probably depends on what works logistically for the grower's operation. Um, but myself, I, I probably tend to like a, a more narrow, more narrow row. Okay. Well, all right, Todd. We're just a few minutes over. Todd, we want to again thank you uh, for taking your time today for making this great presentation. Uh, as we wrap up, uh, this 
uh, webinar will be posted on the Ilso Advisor and webinar page in a few days. And again, if you did sign up and participated today and submitted your CCA number, your num name and number will be submitted for one CEU and crop management. If you're listening to the recording of this webinar, you can go online in your CCA account and you can apply for one credit in, in crop management for listening to this webinar. Again, I want to give thanks to uh, uh, Todd Steinick with AgriGold for taking the time to prepare the, and present this webinar. And on behalf of the Illinois Soybean Checkoff, uh, thank you very much for participating today. We hope to see you back at more webinars in the future. Again, thank you very much, and this webinar is over.